It started as a typical weekend as a senior in high school. A few buddies and I camped for the night at Fossil Creek in northern Arizona. Nothing crazy. We spent the day swimming in the creek and had a bottle of Jack Daniels and five grams of bud to keep us entertained for the night. It was on the hike out of the canyon that things became interesting. As a drug-obsessed teenager, I not only tried my fair share of psychoactive substances, but had also studied the local flora for anything psychoactive. While hiking up the trail, I noticed a beautiful plant that I identified as Angel's Trumpet. I had looked into this plant just a little bit and couldn't recall much of what I had read. I just knew that the seed pods were the part that would make you trip. Being overconfident and completely foolhardy, I picked six seed pods off the plant and continued hiking back to my friend's car. When we arrived in the parking lot, I looked at my friends to see who wanted a trip with me on the Angel's Trumpet seeds. We had a couple hour car ride ahead of us back to Phoenix and I thought it would be fun to feel the come up and start tripping while we ventured home. It was a Sunday afternoon and my parents were going to be out of town until Monday morning. I figured I would have plenty of time to sober up from the trip before school or my parents returned. My friend Anthony, the most adventurous of the bunch, was the only one who wanted to take the seeds with me. Pussies, pussies, we joked with our buddies as we split the seed pods, three each, between ourselves. We emptied out the seeds onto napkins and looked at each other as we were about to unknowingly make the worst mistake of our lives. To this day, four years in the future, I still have nightmares about this experience and wish I could go back to this pivotal moment to stop myself. There were dozens of seeds in each of the napkins. We were so reckless and sure of ourselves that we didn't even bother to count them. Down the hatch, we swallowed them whole and washed the vile seeds back with orange Gatorade. We got into the back of my other friend's old Toyota 4Runner and hit the road back to Phoenix. It wasn't long before we started feeling the preliminary effects and I was feeling nervous about what we had done. My limbs were starting to go numb, my mouth was drier than hell, and an overwhelming sense of dread and remorse was beginning to chip away at the fragile edges of my teenage ego. The Arizona step scene out the window passed through my field of vision in a haze, and I looked into Anthony's face to gauge how he was reacting to the sinister medicine we had consumed. Face is an index of mind. The words of the Indian sage to a young Terence McKenna reverberated through my skull as I saw the same nervous yet controlled expression on Anthony's face that I was projecting onto mine. For the time being, we were okay, but my mind was racing as the uncomfortable side effects continued to mount in intensity. Had we poisoned ourselves? Was that even the right plant? I don't even remember what this drug is supposed to feel like. Why did I get us into this? All of this spun around and around in my head while I did my best to remain calm and not let on to any of my friends that I was on the verge of freaking out. At one point, I had my friend pull over on the side of the highway so I could piss. My bladder felt like it was going to burst from all the water we had been drinking during the hike out of the canyon and the orange Gatorades we drank for the Detura seeds. But as I stood on the side of the road with cars zipping by, I couldn't piss more than a few drops. It was the worst sensation of trying to force the pee out and even though I got out only a few drops, I strangely still felt relieved afterwards. By this point, the heavy body load, cotton mouth, and numbness in my arms and legs were in full effect, but Anthony and I weren't feeling much of anything in terms of psychoactive effects yet. We arrived back in Phoenix, and I was the first stop to be dropped off. I occasionally tripped acid and mushrooms alone back in these days, so my friends thought nothing of me being home alone for the rest of whatever this experience was going to be. If anything, they thought it was a good thing that my parents weren't around to catch me tripping on a random plant we found in the wilderness. I got out of the car, told Anthony to call me later that night so we could check in and wave goodbye to my friends as I opened the garage door and stepped into my parents' empty house. From this point on, my memories of this experience are very fragmented and slippery. On a high dose of detura like Anthony and I took, time ceases to be linear, fantasy and reality become intertwined and completely indistinguishable, and the tripper is brought to the brink of death to experience horrors and confusions that are too fantastic to encapsulate in English. I remember it being nighttime and I was outside in my backyard, sitting at the table next to the pool and smoking a joint with Anthony. We were shooting the shit, talking about nothing like we usually did during our smoke sessions. When out of the blue he said, look, in a serious alarmed tone. 
Under the patio light, I clearly saw the irises of his eyes morph into an orangish gill pattern like the underside of a psilocybin mushroom and his pupils the size of dinner plates, black voids leading to I knew not where. I craned my head around, following his gaze, and saw the outline of a woman standing in the darkness on the opposite side of the backyard. What do you want? I blurted out in a shaky voice. I quickly glanced back at Anthony to reassure myself and check his reaction, but he was no longer there. I realized I wasn't sitting at the patio table or smoking a joint at all. The context had completely changed. I was standing at the edge of the backyard under the cool moonlight with my back up against the concrete block wall. The back door to the house was wide open and the woman still stood in the dark on the opposite side of the yard. Who are you? I asked again, feeling unbelievably terrified, more scared than I had ever felt in my life. She didn't reply, but I mentally felt a response of, there is no need to fear, as a flood of both disturbing and beautiful hallucinations came rushing over me. A river of violet energy crashed out of the sky like water and rushed around me and threw me in a violent torrent. I felt I could barely stand and I saw the strangest hallucinatory fragments flash through my mind. Demons peeking around windows, their bulging white eyes darting side to side in search of something. Tibetan Buddhists chanting in a monastery at the top of a windy, snow-covered mountain. The gears inside the engine of an alien spacecraft flying high above my backyard, observing my reaction and the contents of my mind. These images kept coming and coming, and I remember in flashes being able to actually see myself and the woman standing there in the backyard from a third person, aerial perspective. After this episode of intense and delirious hallucination, I regained consciousness sitting in the dark in the middle of the backyard. I was extremely agitated, confused, and afraid, but otherwise felt relatively sober. This is just one of the sinister effects of Detura. You snap in and out of lucidity unpredictably throughout the experience, and there is never a clear I'm coming up or it's wearing off feeling to judge. I walked back into the house via the wide open door and frantically tried to reconstruct what I had been doing for the past several hours that I had no recollection of. I walked to my bedroom and to my horror upon opening the door, my mom and dad were seated on my bed staring at me fixedly. Their faces were distorted and blurry and my dad looked right through me and shouted, what are you on? In a voice that pierced the very essence of my being. I recoiled and turned away, knowing that I was busted, but when I turned back to reply, my parents were no longer there. The room was empty, the house was completely quiet. I stood frozen in the doorway, hearing only the blood rush through my body and a slight ringing in my ears, completely confused and overwhelmed by the entire experience. At some point in the silence, I heard the distant sound of multiple cars turning onto my street and slamming the brakes in front of my house. I was already paranoid beyond belief and raced to the living room to peer out the window and see who or what had come to visit me in the middle of the night. My heart sank as I saw two squad police cars parked right outside my driveway and an officer standing out in the road under the street light. Without even thinking, my immediate reaction was to flee the house and get as far away as possible. I ran out the back door and hopped the fence into my neighbor's backyard. The detour had severely impaired my motor skills and where I'd usually be able to hop the fence with no problem, I could now barely get myself up and over. From my neighbor's backyard, I went through their gate and kept running through neighborhoods until I reached the edge of the desert. This escape is like a fog of paranoia and insanity in my memory. I was running for my life through people's property and I'm sure causing a ridiculous amount of commotion and noise in the dead quiet of a suburban Sunday night. My pursuers were morphing like a liquid in my mind. They started as the police, but at times I was running from demons or the idea of evil itself. I heard people on foot running after me. I would turn back while running and see pitch black shadow people in the distance. I heard the beat of big leather wings behind my right shoulder. I irrationally thought that if I made it to the desert, I'd be able to evade whoever was after me and hide out until daylight, but in reality I had no clue where I was going or what I was doing. 
I had grown up in the area and knew every street like the back of my hand, but that night I would turn onto a familiar street and suddenly find myself in a different neighborhood altogether. Streets looped and repeated themselves. I would look down into the distance and see something random and impossible. I saw a middle-aged man laying out on a lawn chair, tanning himself even though it must have been 2 or 3 in the morning. He lifted his sunglasses to look at me and gave me a wink before laying back down. I saw gigantic moths swarming around a streetlight and inexplicable lights in the sky. Everything was a fear-ridden blur. The next thing I remember is being restrained to a gurney and loaded in the back of an ambulance. The EMT looked down at me and had the head of a man and the body of a snake. It looked like the sun was setting behind his head. What did you take? He asked in a demanding tone. Through my cracked lips and parched mouth, I managed to reply, Angel's Trumpet. I looked down at my body and saw that my legs were covered in cuts and bruises. My shirt was ripped and filthy with dirt. It felt like an eternity passed on the ride to the hospital. I was confused as if to I was being taken to the hospital, to jail, or being abducted by aliens. I later learned that at one point I asked the EMT why they were abducting me and when I could go back to Earth. I said all kinds of crazy things in conversation with the EMTs and people that I imagined to be present. In my mind, Anthony, or something that was impersonating Anthony, was in the ambulance with me for most of the ride and was acting like a guardian spirit. He would point to or pick up different medical devices in the back of the ambulance and explain what they did or how they were used. I would look down at my hands and see that I was holding a copy of whatever thing he was explaining to me and then I would snap out of it and realize I was still bound to the gurney. There was an analog clock on the wall and while Anthony was explaining it to me, it morphed into the wheel of samsara. I saw beings going through the never-ending cycle of birth and death, being born as animals, dying and reborn as angels, taking human births and being born as my family and friends. It was an endless cycle all revolving around this wheel of existence within the clock. I felt as if I had died and was being held in some kind of waiting room, a transition place between worlds. Arriving at the hospital did nothing to sober me up. In fact, it took the better part of a week for me to return to my typical waking consciousness. The doctors forced me to drink a disgusting activated charcoal concoction, which must have been a complete waste since it had been hours since I had eaten the detura seeds. They pumped me full of sedatives, antipsychotics, and other drugs to relieve my severe urinary retention and tachycardia. They also inserted a catheter, which was as horrifying as you would expect while under the influence of Datura. I won't even describe that horror here, and will instead leave it to your imagination. Under sedation, my delirium continued, and I phased in and out of waking consciousness with varying levels of lucidity. At some point, my parents arrived home from their vacation and had to return to their son seemingly on the brink of death, lying insane in a hospital bed. I will never forgive myself for putting them through that stress and all of the trouble I caused from this stupid decision. In my sedated delirium, intense hallucinations continued as I fought for my sanity. A black Labrador came in and out of my hospital room and the jingling of his collar would trigger waves of visions and views through poison kaleidoscopes behind my closed eyes. I could see him trotting through the hospital and his tail wagging back and forth as he passed the rooms full of suffering mankind. Any room he lingered on was an ill omen of that person's approaching death. I had the impression that Anthony was with me during this part of the trip. He was no longer acting as a guardian spirit like he was in the ambulance, but instead was by my bedside, or in the hospital bed next to mine, or standing out in the hallway on the threshold of the room. It wasn't until later that I learned that Anthony had been hospitalized as well earlier in the night. After Anthony was dropped off at home, it wasn't long before he started hallucinating and acting strangely. His mom caught him talking to imaginary people in their kitchen, wildly gesticulating and saying things that didn't make any sense. Anthony later said that he thought he was being interrogated by federal agents about his involvement in the local drug trade. Anthony was a low-level weed dealer at our high school and was always very paranoid about being caught. When confronted by his mom as to who he was talking to, he panicked and tried to run out of the house. She caught up to him fumbling with the lock on the front door, and 
when she tried to restrain him and calm him down, he turned around and punched her square in the face, thinking that she was one of the agents trying to arrest him. After that, the actual police were called, and Anthony was restrained and transported to the same hospital I would be admitted to several hours later. After our stay in the hospital and return to relative normalcy, Anthony and I were both sent to a psychiatric ward on a 72-hour involuntary hold. It took almost a week for me to feel normal again. I thought my eyes were never going to heal and I worried that I'd given myself permanent psychosis. In the days that followed, I saw gnomes marching across the floor in the psych ward like little ants. I would stare at them for minutes, observing them closely, then briefly look away, and when I looked back, they had vanished. Small hallucinations like that and tricks played in my peripheral vision continued far longer than I ever wanted. This experience placed a permanent strain on my relationship with Anthony and my parents. I felt I had let everyone down with the stupid decision and ruined our lives. I remember standing under the hot water in the shower, staring down into the drain and feeling the water flow over my skin like rubber and thinking that things were never going to be normal again. This experience was four years ago now, in April of 2019, and things did eventually turn out alright. With time, my vision and mind repaired themselves and my parents forgave me. In August of that year, both Anthony and I went off to different colleges and have since lost touch. I thank God that no one was seriously injured or killed. After the fact, I learned from my parents that the police had never been called to our house and that instead multiple people in the area had called because I was making so much noise during my frantic flight from the demons in the middle of the night. Taking Datura rips apart the fabric of our consensus reality and exposes the tripper to the spirit realm, but what you find there is not at all pleasant or harmless, especially if you are as unprepared and naive as I was. It is much more a glimpse of hell than of heaven, and I now feel that I have permanently opened a door that cannot be shut in this lifetime. I frequently dream about this ordeal and have flashbacks to the visions I experienced that night. I still feel that woman standing in the darkness, observing my life from a distance and occasionally showing herself in my dreams to this day. I'd call this analog synthetic DMT weed. After receiving a package in the mail from a Chinese vendor, we, my significant other and I, soon could tell that this substance was not the 2FDCK we ordered. It was tan colored and of an earthy ground up consistency. The vendor must have sent us the wrong thing. However, I wanted to make sure it wasn't still 2FDCK. This was the first of my two experiences with this substance. I was attending college at this time. Late one evening, I cut up three small lines to try out. I was pretty sure this wasn't 2F because it wasn't crystallized at all. It was like brown and clumpy. Regardless, I decided to snort it. Right away, my nasal passages burned like hell. The burn didn't go away either. It persisted for an hour. The effects came on slowly. I felt a heavy body load, like I had smoked too much weed. My eyes became bloodshot and I was paranoid. I lay down in my bed hoping to sleep it off. I don't remember that morning very well. I was still very high and was extremely paranoid, everybody could tell. I didn't want to go to class, but apparently I did anyways. I don't remember anything of my activities that day. It was like a blackout from weed. It was after that experience that we came to the conclusion it was a very potent synthetic cannabinoid. My boyfriend compared a lot of photos, and we believe it is 5F-MDMB-2201. Instead of our 2F-DCK, the vendor must have switched up our substance. So instead of the ounce of 2F-RC-Ketamine, we got an ounce of insanely potent spice. We've done more research since then, but there isn't really anything known about 5F-MDMB-2201. One of his friends asked to buy some, so he did. He described sprinkling a little on the end of his cigarette and immediately being paralyzed for five minutes in his chair. This stuff is super fucking potent and is not something to be taken lightly. After more research and looking over what information we could, we found that people reported doing under one milligram of the substance as the usual dose. We are now going to dissolve the substance and coat it onto plant matter to sell as spice. 
However, it only takes 2 to 3 milligrams of this substance to make 1 pound of spice. We will have this shit forever. Okay, so the reason I'm typing this out now is because I had a very bad experience trying it again. I had done some GHB earlier that night and was looking for something else to do. I know mixing really anything with GHB is bad, but I thought I had come down enough to where a little weed wouldn't hurt anything. It was probably 4 hours after I dosed the GHB. He's on probation so he was wanting to see if it would show on tests, so I agreed to take a piss test the next day. He sprinkled on about 4-5 to five granules onto the foil. I think I was laughing because he only put such a small amount on. I walked over to the window with the treated foil, lighter and straw. I kept making fun of it but he persisted that it would be enough. I laughed and then quickly smoked the tiny amount. There wasn't even much visible smoke. I was sure that this wasn't going to do anything. However, I was totally wrong. Not even 10 seconds after I walked from the window to the couch and sit down, an intense body high like nothing else came over me and I was barely able to get to the couch. He asked if I felt it and then it was all fucked up from there. I would describe the substance as DMT spice. The entire trip felt like hours, but in reality my boyfriend said it was between 15 to 30 minutes. The whole time I felt nothing, like I was floating. I was stuck in one position, paralyzed. For hours it felt like I was stuck in a DMT time loop. The whole time I could see geometrical patterns and visuals, bright neon colors, tracers and faces, but nothing like real world images. During the whole thing I felt like I had to resurface and come back to the real world. I felt like I had to relearn images and learn to breathe again. I learned later that I was in a state of psychosis. The whole time I heard somebody, God or the universe, talking to me. It was telling me I had to complete these tasks and relearn everything. I felt like I was moving in a million different ways, figuring out how my body worked and what it took to prove myself that I'm capable of living. At some point, I became very nauseous. I don't remember the feeling of throwing up, but apparently my boyfriend helped me throw up into a plastic bag. All throughout, there was also a voice telling me what to do. It instructed me to breathe, swallow, etc. I completed these tasks. Most importantly was the instruction of breath. I knew if I didn't breathe, I couldn't prove myself to God and I would die. The entire time I felt like I was shaking and tremoring. I saw fractals and visuals constantly. After what seemed to be an eternity, I was able to open my eyes and see the real world. Everything was twisted like DMT or acid, closer to DMT. Everything was fuzzy, glowing, ebbing, twisting and swirling. It did not seem real. It all felt like a simulation. I had strong delusions. I heard my man on the phone and thought they were going to sell a video of me like this to the press. I don't know why I thought of this, but it was very disturbing and kept me paranoid. I stood up, shaking, and still extremely high, saying a bunch of nonsense. I was trying to ask him not to sell the video. I also thought I was in somebody else's apartment. I didn't recognize the man on the phone as my boyfriend until much later. The man said everything was going to be alright and asked me to sit down. I didn't want to sit down because I was scared he was going to do something. However, I followed what he said because I was really dizzy. He offered me some water and I could barely drink without spilling the cup because I was shaking so bad. I remember laying down for a bit longer, slowly regaining sensible consciousness. I eventually recognized that he was my boyfriend and that I was in our apartment. Although I realized I was having a delusion, I still felt an impending sense of doom. He fell asleep on the bed and I was still on the couch. When I felt better, I went over and fell asleep on the bed too. I woke up today and still couldn't believe what happened. I feel anxious about the whole thing and that it was a super big deal. Today I got some more insight and clarification as to what happened. I believe that some of the voices last night were him talking to me. He was asking me if I was okay and holding my head up so I could breathe. He was the one instructing me to breathe. At some point early in the trip I suppose, he came over to see if I was alright. During the trip I thought God was saying, oh you're high, oh you're really high. And then he said in an Irish accent, you're really high aren't you now? Today I asked my boyfriend if he said that and he said yes. 
I guess it's funny now, but it was freaking me out at the time because I couldn't move or do anything. He also said that during the whole thing, he thought I was on the brink of a seizure. He said that I was shaking and trembling the entire time, which I felt at some points of the trip. I was anxious because I was so vulnerable. Never has a drug made me feel that way. As I am writing this, 12 hours later, I still feel stoned, but at least able to function. I am still paranoid and anxious. This whole experience was very scary. It was delirious, super trippy, incomprehensible, and life-threatening. If you were to combine DMT, acid, weed, and Benadryl together, you would yield this horrid drug. So all in all, if you hate yourself, love psychosis, and like to feel like you're seizing for three hours, this drug is for you. If I were you, I would not do 5-F-MDMB-2201. Before I begin to recall one particular Saturday, it should be noted that for the past three days leading up to it, I had been taking daily 25 mg doses of Seroquel. I had been severely depressed for three weeks and was finding a vice in this medication, given to me by my friend who has prescribed it. Not only had it been providing me with some of the most restful, peaceful sleep I had ever gotten, but it had been nullifying my recently chaotic emotions, leaving me neither exceptionally happy nor especially sad. On this night, I had learned that I had seriously underestimated the psychoactive effects of this drug, which is prescribed as treatment for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. I was fully aware of this fact, but I somehow tucked it away as an afterthought. I also convinced myself it was safe because of a sneaking secret suspicion that I may have bipolar disorder myself. There is a history of it in the family, and I have had incidents resembling manic episodes, but I have had no such disorder diagnosed, and certainly no prescription. Saturday around 4.30 p.m., I took my 25 mg tablet after feeling a twinge of unease and desiring a distraction. An hour later, I'm over at my friend's house shooting the shit and playing video games when the Seroquel kicks in. It's a soft, calm feeling that stays in the back of my head, not the foreground. A party is supposed to happen, but our friend who deals and sells to us is absent. So after a phone call from my other friend Eli inviting me for a hash session and offering to sell me a 20 sack, I decided to dip, weighing whether or not to return to the party later. I would not. I drove out to pick up Eli and we met up with another friend, Ash. It's about 8.40 or so when we're all set to smoke. We set up in the shower room of Ash's apartment complex, intending to go for a soak in the jacuzzi afterward. It's necessary for us to hide out in some place concealed due to the butane torch used to heat the pin on Ash's pipe. I packed my regular glass pipe and smoked that with Ash, while Eli took the first hash hit. He started to cough uncontrollably and left the rest of the smoke in the pipe with some hash still left. I quickly took it from his hand and finished the hit. I soon felt very high. Ash's pipe has yielded the highest results in potency out of all the smoking devices I have used. It's given me swirling visuals in the past, and in Eli's room where I had taken LSD before, brought back acid flashbacks. It was a familiar sensation and disorientation. I began to cough as well, feeling pressure in my chest and lungs. Eli and I took Ash's advice and caught our breath with some deep breathing exercises. Now it was time for my own hit. We load up the needle, torch the pin until it's red hot, and I take my hit slowly and efficiently. I fill my lungs and have to exhale to take the second half of the hit. My cough gets much worse instantly. Ash and Eli had coughed till they puked off the hash pipe before, so I decided to go outside and get some fresh air. I dry heaved for several minutes, but never actually vomited. Feeling healthy enough, but incredibly high, I went back to the shower room. At this point, it was a few minutes after 9, and this is where things first began to feel off. Like the altered perception of an LSD onset, no one thing had discernibly changed, but there is a subconsciously tactile feeling lingering in the back of my mind that something was different. The shower room had become stuffy with our breath and smoke, and I felt more nauseous being in the room. I told Ash and Eli that I'm going to the jacuzzi to have a cigarette and exited the shower room again. You know that feeling of having a song stuck in your head? 
Well, as I walked towards the gate for the pool area, I could just hear a song like it was in the back of my mind. Only it was a song I had never heard before. It was muffled, indecipherable, vaguely electronic, but mostly sounded like a continuous tone that changed pitch. I was very high and chalked it up to hash. I reached the jacuzzi and sat down in one of the pool chairs. There was one man in his mid to late twenties soaking in the tub. I offered him a cigarette and pulled out one for myself. He accepted and we started talking. Two things happened here. First, I told him that I had been smoking with my friends, where they were and what they had, without even intending to. It's like the words were just pouring out of my mouth without permission. Luckily, this man was also a stoner and I hadn't just busted my friends. Second, the music I'd been hearing amplified. I can tell now it was music with an irregular beat and strange sampling. It still only sounded like a tone, from a synthesizer perhaps. I looked around the bushes in case it was coming from a nearby car. Unable to find the source of the music, I took off my shirt and moved to sit in the jacuzzi. As soon as I am submerged up to my collarbone, only my head and my hand holding the cigarette exposed, the music amplifies much louder. Loud enough to be playing off a speaker somewhere right by my head. The synthesized tones became high tension strings and I heard robotic beeps and boops. The idea suddenly sunk in that the music might be in my head. I scrambled and searched my mind for any reason why this would be happening. This wasn't an acid flashback, I had never experienced anything like this before. Then I realized I had been taking an unprescribed psychoactive pharmaceutical for 4 days now, medication for serious mental illnesses. The moment I consider that fact, evil laughter interrupts the song. A deep demonic chuckle exactly like you would hear in Halloween specials were reverberating around the walls of the jacuzzi. The song changed back to offbeat electronic music. I started to think of the old lady who loses her mind on uppers and downers in Requiem for a Dream and how maybe I've really pushed myself over the deep end this time. Maybe this music will never go away and I've done irreversible damage to my psyche. At this point, I began to have intense visuals as well. The fences and bushes were dancing and swaying, almost looming over me. The illuminated water, white foam and bubbles from the jacuzzi are exceptionally bright. I look at my damp arm and see long faces without eyes, noses, or any defined features in the water on my skin. Over the music, I start to hear voices talking to each other. The voices are human and loud as though they were yelling some distance to one another. I couldn't understand them, though they were speaking what sounded like English. All of this leaves me extremely frightened, but I remained calm and didn't express any of this to the man sitting with me. I made small talk with him about the security guard walking around instead, not really paying attention to our conversation. As far as I could tell, my behavior was not irregular, though in retrospect I probably looked suspicious as my eyes were darting about, inspecting everything. After a few minutes, when my cigarette is about finished, I tell the man I'm going back to the room. As I exit the jacuzzi, the music returns to its initial inconsistent tone, though the volume of it is still up. I grab my shirt and towel, part ways with the other man and head back to the shower room. I feel very disoriented and uncoordinated as I walk. I knocked on the door and announced immediately that I was in a bad place. I sat down and explained what just happened, all the while I saw shapes all over the walls moving upwards. It looked like a swarm of tiny creatures burrowed under the wall were all escaping out of the ceiling. The music was still playing. I finished my monologue and Eli paused before speaking. He turned to me and said, Maybe you just need to look at it a different way. You've been taking drugs and you're having a reaction due to the combination of them. Once they're out of your system, it'll stop. Just ride it out. Try to treat it like just another trip. This turned out to be exactly what I needed to hear. Hearing those words and repeated mantras of, It's going to go away. This too shall pass. Got me to seriously calm down. The music and visuals persisted, but I took less notice of them. After sitting and continuing to talk for about 10 minutes, that random guy from the jacuzzi came and joined us. We properly introduced ourselves and the man locked the door behind him and sat down. Ash sparked up the fresh blunt he just rolled and feeling calmer now, I decided I would smoke it. The music and visuals subsided and were replaced with a sleepy familiar indica high. 
It was about 11 o'clock when we moved from there to my car, and while I would have refused to drive earlier, I was good and buzzed now and felt confident in my driving capabilities. The only remaining feeling unique to the Seroquel was the ultra-perception sensation I'd felt right before the music started. This was not something that was impairing my cognitive or motor abilities, so I felt safe to drive. We cruised over to AMPM to buy energy drinks and snacks. The outgoing and 420 friendly cashier came out while we were smoking cigarettes by the car and told us to sneak around back. This turned into a very unexpected hash session in the back bathroom of AMPM while the employee was cleaning up. I took another hash hit against my better judgment. Luckily it seemed the Seroquel had indeed passed as no music or visuals returned. Ash parted ways from us and we left the extremely stoned employee to what I'm sure was an enjoyable graveyard shift. Eli and I have a joyful ride home, blasting dubstep music the entire ride. Nothing out of the ordinary, just a typical hash high. I dropped him off, returned home, and passed out on my bed. The next day was groggy and I felt emotionally cold. I went about my quiet Sunday doing homework without a hitch. Ultimately, I don't see any way Seroquel could be used as a recreational drug. It seemed like a possible solution to me as a depressed and desperate but not diagnosed psychologically ill person. Quetiapine may be an answer for some, but not for me. I am not crazy, I don't need medication to not be crazy, and I don't need to become crazy. Hello, I'm a 19 year old male. This experience happened when I was 16 years old. I first got the ideas of inhaling substances from school from some goth kids saying they did in the cafeteria. Me and my friends weren't part of this group of people, so I didn't talk to them, but I remember how much fun the idea of getting high on these would be. I heard them talking about duster, and I remember my mom having a can of Sentry duster. I figured this would do the job. Having heard about gas inhaling too, I thought, fuck it, might as well go all out. That thought will haunt me for the rest of my life. It was the long weekend and I knew that one night I would have the house to myself like I usually did cause I was an only child and that was something that I liked. Anyways, they finally left and I put my plan to work. I went to the garage and got my dad's gas can, then I went and grabbed the duster from the cleaning cupboard. I went to my room, naive with both the gas and the duster, and got ready for a good time. I turned on my TV and set the gas and duster on my TV tray. I sat on my bed and kind of started getting nervous. I passed it off though thinking that it wouldn't hurt me, besides, those other kids did it and seemed fine. I first started with the duster, I thought I'd take a few hits and then go for the gas and a few of that and be done. So after taking a few deep breaths in preparation, I shook the duster can and fired the first hit. A warm feeling came over me and I really liked it. Then I got a little lightheaded too. It actually made me really hyper and stupid. I started taking hit after hit, almost full lungfuls. I think I did 8 plus hits within 20 seconds. I was feeling a little more buzzed and my lungs were hurting, so I stopped with the duster. I then switched to the gas, practically laughing just at what I was doing, feeling rebellious and superior. Soon after I switched to the gas, I really felt the duster kicking in, and I started losing it. After four-ish hits of gas, my lungs started burning pretty bad. I was still too stupid to realize that this could be seriously bad for me. Shortly after though, the pain started getting worse and I was almost totally out of it, still not really feeling major effects, I think cause I did it all so fast and was trying to get that done. But then all of a sudden, it hit me like a train. My mouth was on the gas for like 3 seconds before I realized I was still on my hands and knees breathing it in. I knocked it away, spilling it all over my carpet. I got up with my lungs feeling a little better, I didn't even think about cleaning the gas. I knew one thing though, that I was high for the first time, and very high at that. I at first thought it was pretty cool and I was seeing specks of color here and there, then all of a sudden I kept seeing shadows move and things seemed to jump at me. 
This is when I started to panic. As my high started getting closer to the top, my worst nightmare started coming true. I saw an image of death come out of the shadows. I screamed at the top of my lungs thinking that this was the end. Getting higher, I was barely able to walk. As I ran away stumbling, I fell to the ground, hitting my arm on the glass table, destroying it, and seriously cutting my arm. By this point, I was not on the planet any longer, and as I got higher and higher, the sickness also got worse. It didn't help that I was bleeding on everything without even the common sense to patch it up and go to the washroom. While I was lying there on the floor, I looked up and I saw goblins and werewolves, sounds stupid I know, with my parents' heads in there, hands jumping at me and tearing my face off. My lungs got worse also by this point. I could barely breathe, throwing up everywhere. I tried to roll away and scream, but couldn't. I closed my eyes and just saw colors and fire, which made me believe I was in hell. Alternating between coughing, puking, and screaming, I was honestly wishing for death. All this happened within five minutes of my first duster puff. Suddenly, I don't know why, but the puking stopped and was unable to scream. My lungs still felt like they had been ripped from my body, but weren't as bad as before. I kept my eyes closed and all I could hear was evil laughter and Steve Urkel's voice saying, Did I do that? over and over in different tones. That's when I lost all bodily function. I seized up stiff as a board and pissed and shit myself. The thoughts are a blur after that and I passed out. I woke up two hours later. I was still out of it, not able to keep my mind on one thing and still seeing colors, but I remembered that I inhaled. I passed out again. Four hours later, I woke up, still fucked out of my mind, feeling like death. I looked over and saw the disaster I made with the outer part of my forearm cut almost to the bone, lying in blood with more still slowly seeping out. This made me extremely lightheaded and I guess I rolled more than I thought because there was blood all over my basement floor. I crawled to the bathroom where I managed to wrap a towel around my arm. The act of going to the bathroom made my pain and sickness a hundred times worse. After collapsing to the bathroom floor and puking the last of my bile, I passed out again. The next thing I heard was my mother screaming. My parents were home and my mom had found me in the bathroom. At first, they didn't know what happened. My mom stayed in the bathroom while my dad called 911 and looked around. He went in my room and then pieced together what I did. The ambulance got there and I was taken to the hospital where I was monitored, given drugs and an IV. The doctor told my parents I may have given myself brain damage. After being in a chemically induced coma for two days, I awoke and realized my strange surroundings. Only my mind was constantly wandering and I felt a major headache and couldn't think. I could barely remember my name or my parents or friends. After two weeks, I was let out of the hospital with my parents aware of the damage I did to myself. All my mother could ask was, why? My father has pretty well disowned me because I am not the same person I used to be. My brain is altered. It is three years later now. I don't have friends because I can't socialize. I went from a normal healthy kid that was good in school with a high 80 average to a high school dropout who can't run 10 steps without having to stop for half a minute to catch my breath because I fucked my brain and lungs up. To this day, I still have a pounding headache and can't even walk straight. This story alone took me over three days off and on to write and without spelling check. You probably wouldn't read it to know that I am screwed for life, all because of one dumb mistake. I can only warn others that it's not worth it, and I wish I knew the dangers before I went and tried something stupid like that. My parents never left me home alone again. To protect the people associated with this story, I will be using fake names of course. 
On Halloween, James, Roy, Jane, and myself decided to go down to Roy's family home down in the countryside. It's an isolated house and there's nothing nearby. The perfect, most safe spot to take psychedelics. So we thought. Within the first hour of the trip, it started hitting hard and we were all having a great time, laughing, sharing what we were seeing, and bonding together. Suddenly, it started to go very bad, very quickly. James asked if he could take off his clothes so he can feel freer. We, of course, consulted Jane and she was okay with it. However, once James's clothes were off, he started to have a conversation with himself. Yes, 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 but I don't know if we should. No, 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 but maybe. Yes, 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 yes. He came into the room and he shouted, We all want to fuck Jane. At this point, me and Roy started saying, Mate, of course not. That's not what this is. James started to have the conversation with himself again. No, 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 but maybe. I don't know. Yes, I want to fuck Jane. I decided to take him into a different room to try and talk him out of what he was saying. You're making her feel really uncomfortable. We need to make Jane feel as comfortable as possible. So please get it in your head that no one here is having sex with anyone. Nothing was getting through. He just kept having this conversation with himself. More sayings and phrases were being added to the loop. He started shouting, I'm in love with Jane. I want to fuck Jane. Yes, yes, yes. But I don't know if we should. No, no, no. But maybe. Yes, yes, yes. As of right now, I can't tell if I'm in love with Jane or not. Obviously, Jane started getting really freaked out, as were myself and Roy. We had no idea what was going on, but he kept making sudden movements towards Jane. He tried to run at her, so I slapped him to try to get him out of this trance and held him down. He bit his tongue as I slapped him, so blood started covering his teeth, which was as freaky as it gets. This constant loop was happening for six hours with James trying to get to Jane. We barricaded ourselves away from this monster that's taken over our friend. We called people trying to get help in the panic state we were in, but we were so far in the middle of nowhere, we couldn't get help. We had to keep an eye on him so we couldn't lock him in a room unsupervised. After a few hours, he started to settle physically, but still stuck in this loop within himself. He still tried to make advances to Jane, but myself or Roy got in the way before he reached her. Jane and Roy decided to go to bed so we can get out of this horror house as early as we could the next day. I stayed with James. At this point, in the middle of the night, he was on the couch not moving, so I continued to watch Naruto. Highly recommend on any psychedelic. At some stage, he woke up and he stared at me. The only light was coming from the TV, so it was dark and scary. His face was full of distress. He looked at me as if I was a hostile figure. He stood up and walked over to me, hands clenched, staring at me with eyes I can only describe as full of bloodlust, pure hatred. He then turns around and grabs a tool off the fireplace and looks at me. At this moment, I was terrified for my life. I thought James was going to attack with this tool. He puts it down and goes into the kitchen, where there are a lot more lethal weapons. I use this opportunity to get out of this room and find Roy. Roy came down and we found James on the couch. Roy touched James on his chest, which seemed to help him calm down. After another 25 minutes, James comes back around. He asked for the date seven times in two minutes. We thought his brain had turned to mush. He eventually came completely back to us. Roy and I decided to talk through it the next day. The next day, we sat down to describe what happened. However, James was talking as though he was the victim in a horrific trip inside his own head. He talked to Jane alone, and Jane told me he said, If you just let me touch you more, it wouldn't have happened which is, to me, much more disturbing than the whole night itself. He blamed Jane for his psychotic episode because she didn't consent to him touching her. He described what he went through, which sounded like a horrific, traumatizing experience. The thing is, though, we didn't take all the stamps we had. After he told us details of his terrifying trip, 
he asked if he could have some of the stamp left to take home. If his trip was as bad as he said it was, there's no way he would want to take them again. I obviously refused and said there is no way I was giving him the drug that made him act that way the night before. He got angry and annoyed, so I threw them down the toilet. James, Roy, Jane, and myself have known each other for 15 plus years. James is and has been one of my closest friends for the entirety of my life. I am worried he has a genuine problem. He doesn't know the extent of his actions. He has traumatized all of us, particularly Jane, who has had a history of abusive relationships. But also myself. I've had nightmares and flashbacks every day since, and I feel completely unhinged. I want to help James. I don't think our friendship could continue if he doesn't realize what he has done. I know it's a long read. I appreciate you making it this far. Could anyone please help me or give me advice on how to tackle such a situation? Recently, I've been researching different ways to introduce different amino acids into my system, the intention being to fix certain physical issues I have. I will begin by saying that through the experience that here follows, I now understand that I know nothing about neurology and am forfeiting my delusional doctorate. To be wholly honest, I don't quite follow the consequences undergone. I woke at 8.30 this morning to my girlfriend pouncing atop my sleeping frame. My day began brilliantly. She left and I decided to amalgamate my new concoction. I ground up roughly six pills of glucosamine into a crude powder. I did the same to a number of different aggregates. My cognition is a little, let's say, removed at present, so I cannot precisely recount the amount of each substance I mixed therein. However, I will say that the previous night I purchased the bottles of each substance. Of the L-theanine, I have six pills left. There were 30 originally. The mixture was comprised of glucosamine, L-theanine, DMEA, DHEA, L-tryptophan, and 5-HTP. It was extremely foul, especially in only a cup of water. I chased this with a cup of yerba mate, 3 grams a packet. I believe had I stopped here, I would have gone through the day unmolested. However, I had been reading up on Yohimbe and figured I had nothing to lose. I had uncovered 7 capsules of Yohimbe, blended with yerba mate leaves, in a drawer. One capsule contained 169 milligrams of this blend. I downed all seven. My chemistry session ended here at around 9.10. The drive to school was normal. I cannot recall any singular alteration of mood until arrival. I was in class, seated, at 9.30. By 10 a.m., I started feeling very blissful. I decided that I liked my mixture. I enjoyed economics thoroughly for the first time. 10.30 a.m. I realize I am horribly wrong. I recognize a light quiver in my hand movements across my paper, steadily transforming into a severe tremor. The shape of my hand clenching a pencil produces a profound seizure in my arm, and upon pressing it to the page, I seem to mimic a polygraph. The shaking grew exponentially worse as time elapsed, being another five minutes I found I could not calm my upper body. I tried focusing it into my fingers, rapidly tapping the table with my left hand. I grew restless. Eventually, my entire body was shaking uncontrollably. As this progressed, I started to notice a lightheadedness and a flutter in my chest. I would not venture to call this a high. I would very nearly describe it as a poisoning. It is now 10.40 a.m. and I can do no more in regards to thought than fear for my health. I don't even remember conversation from here on out. I am, however, aware that several of my peers no longer find me a suitable association. I'm sure this means my endeavors to socialize were very strange. 11 a.m. I check my pulse. The speed scares me all the more. My heart is racing. I feel as though I could walk through the wall. Class ends and I leave with a fixed, frightened stare. The nausea begins. I cannot even attribute this feeling to any other experience. The need to vomit is overwhelming, but even after hovering over the toilet for roughly a half an hour, I can't bring myself to do it. The burning in my throat is painful. My school usually has the radio playing through a speaker in the ceiling of the bathroom. 
I've heard this song a thousand times here, and I'm very certain that the distinguished hum accompanying the beat is not a part of it. I have to piss. The desire to, the need to, has never been so great in all of my life. I quickly discover I can't. My urinary tract seems to be constricted. It's painful to even try to force it. It takes me another 10 minutes to piss. I decide it's time to head home. My principal is very flexible, so she lets me leave as soon as I tell her what I'm feeling and what I have taken. Driving pisses me off. Movement makes every effect worse. The lightheadedness, the flutter. I'm starting to have difficulty breathing. When I arrive, I can barely walk. I start to puke. The violence with which the pain is ineffable. The shaking in my arms and legs has stopped. Now only my head is seizing. I choke out my stomach for a good two minutes. I've broken into a sweat. My face is scorching. I must have looked very strange to a passerby, aside from the heaving. I rush upstairs to the bathroom to wash my face off. At this point, my symptoms seem to have been assuaged. The overbearing lightheadedness is still present, as is my skipping heartbeat. I notice a droop to my eyes. The skin seems to be heavy. I turn on the light in my bathroom. My face is dotted with welts. I look as though I'm having an allergic reaction. My entire face, forehead and neck, is covered in bright red dots. I call my doctor. He says to haul ass over there. I come to the conclusion this sounds like a good idea. As it were, the blood vessels in my face burst due to the amount of force with which I puked. It's going to take a week to replenish. I am still incapable of much coherence verbally. My head is throbbing. I feel as though something has corroded inside my skull, and still is, eating away. I have never seen a report on the hallucinations caused by the excessive dopamine output of methamphetamine. I stumbled upon it by accident after about 30 hours, and the hallucinations lasted about 36 hours as my cells were annihilated. Note, these are not caused by sleep deprivation combined with a stim. I have had mild eye corner hallucinations caused by staying up for about 36 hours on the stimulant psychedelic DOC. This is caused by dopamine forcing itself into cells it's not meant to enter. I ended up trying this mostly because I'm ADHD and meth can be prescribed as disoxin by the USA pharmaceutical industry. I tried it shortly after my disastrous experiments with methylphenidate. I also submitted this trip report to Arrowhead and Psychonaut Wiki. 7.30 PM I just tried meth. I snorted it twice Sunday and snorted it repeatedly every few hours as I stayed up all night Monday until I snorted a line at 7.30 p.m. I had been having the subtle choline visuals for a good hour and they died down for a bit so I snorted 45 milligrams. I got charged by a one meter tall black spinning wire monster shaped like the interactive buddy as I walked around my bed. I walked around my bed after doing that line and I see him standing there with arms outstretched 45 degrees towards the ground and then he raised his right arm and pointed it at me. He charged right through me and then I turned and watched him dance and fade smoothly into my backpack in the corner. I actually picked up the backpack and looked behind it because it was so realistic and I saw nothing. I then sat down and within a minute, I saw about 40 realistic black but very slightly rainbow black widow spiders charging me from all sides in waves for about an entire hour. Each wave took about 1 or 2 seconds to reach me before they instantly reappeared back from the wall about 4 meters away. They were each about a half meter in diameter. I tried to focus on my computer because it really sucked as my cells were penetrated and annihilated by the unhampered dopamine efflux. I see bugs crawling all over in the carpet and faces swirling. I'm getting briefly touched on the back of my neck, on my leg, and all over my body. I did some research while being attacked by hallucinations and it was probably in part due to my M1 muscarinic receptor being dogged by excessive dopamine output. Of course, there are a ton more mechanisms touched by the excessive dopamine output, but research is hard to come by. 7 AM 
I saw a 2D, but sometimes morphing in 3D, black entity in my carpet reminiscent of a cartoon 30s gangster I decided to call Mr. Homie. He had a suit, hat, and flat top sunglasses and was about 20 to 25 centimeters tall. Mr. Homie had the power to paint 40 plus variations of something onto my vision, and by that I mean he reacted to the things being painted, and he also reacted to me. He appeared to be some kind of cerebral cortex manifestation reacting to my normal prefrontal cortex thoughts as I walked around my apartment. I remember seeing a salamence before it was butchered and transfigured into something homosexual and violent. The gay stuff was something like Meatwad from Aqua Teen shaking his ass in the intro of the last season, or it could be two shadow dudes, animals, or monsters fucking. I hypothesize there are some connections in my brain that are opened by a lack of choline driven by the M1 receptor I mentioned, allowing the cerebral cortex to bring info from the hippocampus and place it into the ocular electrical feed before it arrives at the prefrontal cortex for analysis. It could feed memories like hold up a cheeseburger to show me I should eat it because my body was hungry. I was very noticeably surprised and astonished by my hallucinations at every turn. Because of this surprising result, it looks like GABA neurons can become addicted to one's own dopamine supply, and it is known that GABA withdrawal can be deadly. Everywhere I looked, spiders and bugs were already there, and they were realistic 3D moving entities. These entities were up to a meter in diameter. They were formed of swirling black lines, some small enough to create a realistic entity, while others were meter wide chaotic swirling lines. I could not hear them. Lack of glutamate allows that auditory hallucination connection to come to my prefrontal cortex if I am to believe my many dissociative experiments. Alternatively, perhaps severing some other connection makes it impossible to hallucinate many sound frequencies at all. Mr. Homie was working to scare me because I fucked up my amp shit and fucked myself over with meth, but I can't be scared. Mr. Homie kept taunting me, laughing, and making gay shadow caricatures. These hallucinations lasted about 24 hours as the dopamine probably had no natural mechanism to be removed from its destructive, unnatural place in various acetylcholine and hormonal synapses. It took about until 7am the next day for the hallucinatory experience to be over. I actually felt mostly fine after the experiment, but that damage is definitely irreversible. I am never using meth again because it irked me from the moment I used it, just like Vyvanse. I don't like the excess of DA to NE ratio, nor the Sigma 2 activation and the serotonin release. I snorted it over 5 days and I stayed up 50 hours straight. When I peed, the smell was of putrid chemicals and it lingered in my bathroom for a few days. The acetylcholine problem snuck up on me again like when I tried using MDA to fix immediate amphetamine withdrawal, but this time I wasn't plagued with suicidal thoughts, and the hallucinations were different and mostly visual. Dopamine overflows into serotonin, acetylcholine, and finally, adrenal receptors to try to safely displace the excess dopamine. Various other mechanisms like hormones for human growth and childbearing are likely affected too. If you continue to use meth after having a pissed off adrenal hallucination, I'm sure the hallucinations become gigantic and you die in slow motion. Methamphetamine appeared to have NET properties since it burned me over my whole body like 4-HOMET and also like burning withdrawals people describe from cocaine and crack. It lacks the necessary dopamine inhibiting function which amphetamine possesses and I think this leads to the poisonous feeling even in small amounts. Perhaps eventually the excess dopamine flows into the dopamine inhibiting mechanism, providing a false sense of security like when the unnatural dopaminergic acetylcholine action brings a false sense of calmness to the experience. Before I started hallucinating, the frequencies of sound I could hear were altered to make everything sound like it was coming from a tin drum. It doesn't appear suitable for use by anyone except people in a war zone. The excessive dopamine output and lack of an inhibiting mechanism by meth and newer drugs, possibly like alpha PVP, saws into the body, allowing many hidden mechanisms to be unearthed and subsequently destroyed or abused. This can create the sadistic types like Hitler by altering the natural mechanisms involved in sex. 
The government is trying to maintain these things using ADHD as a cover for his desoxin prescription, which I'm sure a high-ranking politician like Prince Andrew or a wealthy socialite like Jeffrey Epstein would have no issue obtaining. It's only approved for 5 milligrams, but it would be easy to forge the documents and siphon more of the drug from the documented restricted medical output. It would also be easy to masquerade illicitly produce meth as prescription desoxin, and no tricks would be needed for the medical records. I think prescription methamphetamine, desoxin, should be banned. The way life works is mind-boggling. The most inconceivably intense trip in my life was not caused by any psychedelics, but because I simply stayed up for 60 or so hours straight, which in turn was because of the boredom caused by having no drugs. Before this experience, I had heard that I had delirium from lack of sleep, but I didn't even begin to fathom the intensity caused by it. I didn't stay up for the purpose of hallucinating at all. It just so happened that two days before, my doctor doubled my dexedrine dosage, and I had recently received a lot of new DVDs as presents. I merely wanted to see how far I could push myself in a five-day-long movie-watching marathon. I had taken my daily dose of 45 mg dexedrine at 7 each morning since Monday, but as far as I know, there were no other drugs in my system. I've considered that maybe this experience was some kind of horrific flashback, or that for some odd reason I was smoking too many cigarettes, I'm currently up to 8 to 12 a day, and that somehow caused a psychedelic journey. I know the trip was from sleep deprivation alone, but I cannot force my mind to accept that such a brilliantly frightening trip could have been caused by just that and no illicit substances. Anyways, I wasn't on any other drug than my souped up amount of dexedrine, which begins to wear off at around 8 o'clock. During the second day of staying up, I began to feel slightly disoriented, but no major visual or auditory hallucinations except for the occasional seeing things out of the corner of my eye, which happens fairly often when sober. All of the second night up, I was watching movies, but it was hard to focus on anything happening on the TV. My mind seemed to be charged with 500 volts of electricity. Extremely random thoughts kept popping into my mind, and sometimes I would catch myself subconsciously muttering them to myself. I came up with the most brilliant revelations and ideas that night, but the following trip forced me to forget them all. I first noticed slight visual disturbances when dawn just started to break, and my room turned from a dull light blue to some kind of blue that I have never seen before. It was an odd mix of every blue I would ever seen, but distorted in a way that I could not figure out. It was about at that time when I realized I should get some sleep, at least a few hours before school. However, the longer I laid idly in my bed, it seemed the faster my brain was working. I swear I was thinking four things at a time for five consecutive seconds before I came up with a whole new group of ideas that I would consider until the process started over. The bumps on my ceiling began to slowly swirl when I didn't focus on them, and my window kept appearing to have ripples whenever I glanced at it. I didn't really catch on to the fact that I was about to have some kind of psychedelic experience until that moment, and all of a sudden I got that here we go sensation in my stomach. At first I didn't know what to feel, and a fear overtook me. I usually take hell of a good care of myself at least three days before any kind of psychedelic experience, and the fact that one had snuck up on me while I was unprepared caused a rapid movement of bad thoughts to flow through my mind. I continued freaking myself out with those damn what-if questions, thinking of every possible thing that could and possibly would go wrong, i.e., what if my heart suddenly explodes and I have to attend my classes anyways, for about 10 or so minutes before the realization that I would have a free trip came to me. This immediately lifted my mood as I love to trip out and haven't ever had a bad trip in my life before. I usually end up freaking myself out for the first 5-10 to 10 minutes of a trip anyways, but I always tend to forget about it and enjoy myself for the rest of the duration. This revelation, if it may so be called that, lifted my mood greatly, and the negative energy that I felt in the air immediately turned to a euphoric daze, and I allowed myself to think of the craziest ideas and concepts. Up until this point, I had been trying to stop thinking so much because I had wanted sleep. Now instead of the tragic, I'm doomed to die this day attitude I had been harboring, I took on a whole new personality, and it was good. It was about 30 or so minutes after this revelation that I saw my first real hallucination. I was on this very computer talking on AIM when I took a quick glance at the living room mirror, which is about 6 feet tall and very wide. 
At first, I just saw myself looking at me, but then to my horror, I realized the shape of some menacing life form directly behind me. From the bit I could make out, I determined that it was some kind of demonic man, and with my new thought process, I quickly reasoned that he was here to dissect my brain for some kind of mineral or chemical. I stared in horror, not daring to look directly at it, but kept staring at my own reflection. I finally gained enough courage to cast a quick glance at his face, and when I did, it was gone. All that remained was the blank white wall above my head. I forced myself to laugh and reminded myself that I was tripping and that I would be fine. After all, I was only on a harmless drug. At the time, I didn't remember that I was tripping from not sleeping. I would actually believed that I had taken something, although I spent the longest time trying to think of what, but could never bring myself to say. After that horrific episode, I was dying of both hunger and thirst, so I walked, half walked, half stumbled rather, to the kitchen to eat whatever was left from whenever. It was still pretty dark, the sky was still that unnameable light bluish color. I opened my refrigerator door to make my selection of breakfast when the fridge light automatically went on. This surprised me so much that I jumped back into the wall behind me and yelled, what the fuck? I had forgotten that there was a light in there at all, and because of the darkness in the house it seemed like a blinding flash of pure white light. It took a few minutes to figure out the mechanics of it all, and soon I determined that the light could in no way hurt me. So I braced myself and opened the door again, but this time I was expecting it, so everything was normal. As it turned out, I had scheduled to go shopping that day, so unfortunately I could find nothing to eat, so I just poured myself a lot of water and returned to the computer. At this point, I wasn't scared, just timid and on alert, like I had inhaled a large amount of cocaine for a whole night. My thought process was altered greatly, and I was thinking like I had never thought before. I resumed my talking to friends when I happened to glance at that damn mirror again, only this time to see outstanding ripples protruding from the exact center. This reminded me of a square container of water, which reminded me of a fish tank, which caused me to become increasingly curious about the fish tank in the living room. So now I had to quench my curiosity about fish and water, and I got up and walked across the living room to the fish tank. As I walked, it seemed that the floor grew, making it appear that I wasn't walking anywhere. I continued for a few minutes, expecting it to stop. It didn't, so I got frustrated and decided to sprint the rest of the way. I had only ran about three steps when I ran smack dab into the opposite wall, which confused me further, as it appeared to be 15 feet away a second ago. Finally, I reached the fish tank to stare at my fish, and what I saw astonished me. The fish were gliding through the water rather than swimming, making it appear that they were floating in mid-air. Amazed, I touched the glass, expecting to touch a fish. Then I remembered it was a fish tank and that I was being idiotic, so I returned to the computer console and resumed talking to my friends, who were apparently not listening to my rambling of every thought that passed through my mind. I continued this without incident for about 10 minutes when I got bored of being ignored and decided to watch another new DVD in my room. I made the trek to my room which seemingly took an hour, and when I opened the door, I was suddenly aware that Al Pacino on my Scarface poster was moving his mouth as if he was silently talking. Surprisingly, this wasn't the least bit odd, and I took my place on my bed with a grin as if it was a normal day. I put in a random disc from my new Futurama Season 3 collection, and as soon as the images were on the screen, I started a fit of hysterical, uncontrollable laughter. When the laughter subsided, I noticed that the 30 minute long episode was already almost over, which was extremely surprising for I had only thought I was laughing for a minute or so. My sense of time was horribly distorted. From this point on, I don't remember anything. I thought I had nodded off, but apparently not. When I woke up, it was about 19 hours later and just turning to night, but since it was fairly dark when I blacked out, I thought I had only took a short nap. I woke to find 50% of the living room oddities, coasters, pencils, the downstairs phone, a vase with live flowers, in my room placed in odd positions and odd places. I found walking down my stairs harder than usual due to the fact that there were orange traffic triangle plastic objects on every other step, which were outside in the shed. Every light downstairs and upstairs except my room were on, but the kitchen was exactly as I had left it. The only explanation I can think of is me in a delirious muddle randomly doing whatever seemed natural until I passed out, which I luckily did on my bed. Anyways, thus concludes my lengthy experience of sobriety and delirious states. I'm not too sure if there's a lesson to be learned from this, but it was quite a journey. 
even though it was kind of pleasant, I will probably never do this again due to the migraine the next day. It blew.